A classic bit of teacher advice often given to those new to my profession is that you have to start the year really strict. Some say you shouldn't even smile before November. The logic here is that it's much easier to become more lenient than it is to become more strict as the year goes on. Once people settle into habits of handing in work late or interrupting each other or whatever, it's very hard to bring order back. Being strict at first and offering mercy later is easier than being merciful first and then being strict. Quick note, I've never actually been able to follow this advice. I smile like a self-conscious fool on the first day. I just want people to like me. But if a teacher makes the mistake of leading with mercy and then needs to tighten up the rules a bit mid-year, Sometimes, an outside force, like an assistant principal, is called in to be the disciplinarian and reset the expectations of the classroom. This is all about reputation. If the teacher has a reputation for being relaxed about the rules, the rules will be relaxed and the teacher will need to invoke the reputation of a strict assistant principal in order to right the ship. They'll need to lean on the rules and disciplinary structures of the school rather than themselves. Measure for Measure starts with the Duke of Vienna fearing that his city, or his classroom if we're going to extend the metaphor, has become a little too unruly. His attempt to bring moral order back to his city is how the play starts. In this video, we're going to go through Act 1 of Measure for Measure play-by-play play, and see how he intends to do this and analyze his motives along the way. The play starts with the Duke of Vienna speaking to a judge, Aeschylus. He is telling Aeschylus how capable and wise he thinks Aeschylus is, that he's the most capable and experienced person in understanding the nature of our people, our city's institutions, and the terms for common justice. So it's a little strange that the very next thing he says is that he plans to deputize a man named Angelo, not Aeschylus, to serve as Duke in his place as he goes abroad. He just wants the approval and support of Aeschylus in doing this. Angelo, we learn, has a reputation for virtue, but also a reputation for not living a very public life. The Duke begins his address to Angelo by saying, Heaven doth with us as we with torches do, not light them for ourselves, for if our virtues did not go forth of us, t'were all alike as if we had them not. He's telling Angelo that Angelo's goodness isn't a virtue unless he can also lead others to virtue, as a torch lights up space, not for itself, but to lead others. It's an interesting idea on its own, but it's made more interesting when Duke claims that he loves people, but doesn't want to be on stage for their eyes. Though it do well, I do not relish well their loud applause, he says. So, in short, in the first scene, we have the Duke, a man who says he doesn't want public attention anymore, give his power to a man who also doesn't like attention, with the argument that virtue needs attention, or it's not of any use. If that doesn't make sense, you're not alone. As soon as the Duke leaves, Aeschylus and Angelo look at each other and basically say, I have no idea what just happened, or to use their fancier language, a power I have, but of what strength and nature I am not yet instructed. The Duke will be more honest with himself in scene three, but first, in scene two, we get a look at what Vienna is like with the puritanical Angelo in charge. A man named Claudio is arrested because his fiancée is pregnant, which means he has violated the laws regarding premarital sex. These laws apparently have been around for a while, but nobody has enforced them. Rather than being taken straight to jail, though, Claudio is paraded around the streets. Public shaming for crimes related to sexual behavior thought to be outside the norm in any time period is pretty common practice. Shame is a powerful tool, and Angelo's strategy here is to make people believe that sex within a loving consensual relationship, but outside the marriage contract, is shameful. It's not just the punishment, which by the way is beheading, that acts as a deterrent, but the shame associated with the act. It's important that people fear their public image in addition to fearing for their life. This is what keeps everybody's sexual desire oriented in only the approved ways. And if you think that this is just a bunch of foolishness and that this way of thinking never works because sexual desire just doesn't work like that, and that in the best case scenario, this will only move those sexual behaviors underground, you're not alone. Angelo is not the moral center of this play, regardless of his reputation among the characters in it. And if you think that this is something that Claudio shouldn't be ashamed of at all, you're also not alone. Lucio, a character who seems to be well acquainted with brothel culture, sees Claudio and asks if he's been accused of murder and lechery before learning the truth. 
Like, he can't even believe that this level of shaming is happening to somebody simply because he had sex within a loving relationship. Before the two friends part ways, Claudio asks Lucio to do something for him. Claudio says that his sister, Isabella, is about to enter a convent and that Lucio should find her and ask her to plead on his behalf. He believes that Isabella's reputation for virtue might help his case. He says, Implore her in my voice that she make friends to the strict deputy, bid herself assay him. Which, okay. The Duke is hoping the reputation of Angelo will give Vienna moral direction. Claudio hopes that the reputation of Isabella will give Angelo moral direction. Everybody is looking for a moral surrogate, and so that's fine. But it gets a bit creepier in the next line. Claudio adds that he believes that in her youth, there is prone and speechless dialect such as move men. In other words, he thinks that her physicality might be persuasive to men. Sure, she's good with reason and discourse, but that's a side note to her physical presence. Which takes us to the third scene, where the Duke admits that his reason for giving his power to Angelo is that he hopes that Angelo will enforce the laws that he has not. I have on Angelo imposed the office who may in the ambush of my name strike home, and yet my nature never in the fight to do it in slander. In other words, Angelo can be strict in his place so that people will still think he's the cool teacher in the room. And not only that, but the Duke has no plans to actually go abroad. Instead, he asks Friar Thomas, a priest, to disguise him as a friar so that he can walk around town and hear people talk about how cool the Duke is and how much they miss him. He wants to preserve his reputation. He also wants to leverage the reputation of friars to move about freely, have people open up to him honestly, and have people trust his advice. And that brings us to scene four, a scene in which Isabella is talking with a nun at the convent of St. Clair. The nun explains to Isabella the strict rules of the convent. They cannot speak with men unless the prioress is also there. If they choose to speak to a man, they cannot show their face. And Isabella responds to these strict codes of conduct by asking if they couldn't be more strict. So while Vienna became more sexually active, Isabella seeks to remove herself entirely from the sexual world. And no wonder. Even her brother says that she has speechless dialect that moves men. The patriarchy is strong in Vienna, so who can blame her for just wanting to opt out of that whole situation, removing herself from the game entirely? When the rules of the game are stacked against her, who can blame her for not wanting to play? It's at this time that Lucio comes to tell her about Claudio, her brother's situation, and ask for help. She doubts that she can be of any help, and Lucio responds beautifully that... Our doubts are traitors and make us lose the good we oft might win by fearing to attempt. It's a convincing enough line because Isabella says that she'll see what she can do. So in this first scene, we have two people, Angelo and Isabella, who both have a reputation for virtue and both have the impulse or natural proclivity to remove themselves from the world. Yet they are called into action. Both go to this social world of action reluctantly. Angelo is asked to oversee the city of Vienna, and Isabella is asked to advocate for her brother. They are both called into service. They have quite a bit in common, and yet they are asked to stand on opposite sides of a single issue. Should Claudio's crime be judged with punishment or with mercy? And that seems to be the question of the play from this first act. But I can't help but think that there's another question, like one level above that one. Both Angelo and Isabella derive their reputation and their power from their chastity. Correspondingly, it seems that both the Duke and Angelo attribute the general misbehavior of Vienna to an abundance of brothels and generally sex outside of marriage. I find myself here questioning whether or not the basic assumptions implied by the question of Claudio's case are valid at all. And that's funny, because in this way, I seem to be aligned with Lucio, and I'm not so sure that Lucio is a good dude. We both, Lucio and I, question assumptions like, is chastity a virtue? Is it true that the sexual habits of Vienna are the root cause of the city's problems? Angelo and Isabella want to either punish or forgive Claudio's crime, but Lucio, Pompey, and some others, including me, seem to question whether or not this is a crime at all. In scene two, Pompey says to Abad that she may need to change your place, you need not change your trade. He's saying that regardless of how strict Angelo is, the so-called crime will persist. There's no stopping it. The combined power of law and shame are powerful, but not as powerful as sex. 
The play, from the start, questions the morality of our judgment, both legal and social, in policing the desires of human beings. And spoiler alert, there won't be an easy answer, because there are no easy answers to this question. Though we don't feel like Claudio should feel shamed, we will want to punish the men who use positions of power to coerce women into sexual behavior that they don't want. Which, I mean, I guess the first case deals with desire and the second case with abuse of power, but untangling the connection between desire and power, is that even possible? So the exposition has been set. The major characters have been introduced. The motives have been outlined. The Duke wants everybody to like him, while Angelo enforces the rules. Angelo wants his chastity-derived virtue to lead the city in a more sexually pure direction. Claudio wants to literally keep his head. Isabella wants to retreat from the male gaze, but is called to the virtue of charity to help save her brother's life. And Lucio wants to save his friend Claudio, while questioning at the same time the premise that chastity is a virtue in the first place. We'll pick this up in a week when we take Act 2 play-by-play. -play. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe so you're ready for the next one.